And so we have um, Chris Pearson, who's the senior, uh, a vice president for strategic development at General Atomics, who's going to discuss kind of what some of the themes that we just heard on the stage. Uh, what does that mean for industry? What is the Air Force of the future? How does, uh, how does industry adapt to that? Uh, Mr. Pearson is a f retired, uh, retired Air Force colonel uh, with multiple deployments in Iraq and Bosnia and Afghanistan, a distinguished, distinguished flying cross, bronze star, uh, multiple degrees in computer science and logistics, and um, ideal person to think, think, of, think us through uh, some of the big themes and what that means for industry going forward. Thank you, Peter. It's an honor. Uh, good morning, everyone. I've been given the opportunity to comment on how industry can support the Air Force of the future. This is not an easy task, and frankly, it's a little presumptuous on me, my part to try. I'm not an architect of the future force, and I'm certainly not a spokesman for the entire defense base. But I can share my thoughts and give you my perspective as someone who spent 25 years wearing Air Force Blue and who spent the last nine years in industry. As the national security posture shifts from a focus on non-state transnational threats towards a worldview of great power competition, military and industry must partner to deter aggression and, if necessary, defeat adversaries that threaten the security of the United States and our allies. Since 9-11, and arguably since Desert Storm, the U.S. military has been engaged in a decades-long campaign of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. The Air Force has dominated its adversaries with air and space superiority, practically omniscient, persistent situational awareness, precision attack with impunity, globe-spanning mobility, and robust, trusted command control and communications networks. Industry was the innovation engine that provided the tools and technologies that enabled the Air Force to maintain this advantage. Even as enemies such as al-Qaeda, the Taliban, al-Shabaab, Islamic State have metastasized and evolved. Industry will continue to support the fight against violent extremism because although these threats are diminished, keeping them at bay will require eternal vigilance. The world has never seen such a powerful Air Force as that of the United States Air Force today. And there has never been an aerospace and defense industry as technologically superior as innovative or as robust as the American aerospace and defense industry of today. But our adversaries are gaining ground and have closed the gap in critical areas. The United States military and the industrial base supporting the armed forces reap the benefits of technological superiority and freedom of action in the coin CT fight. But the permissive operating environment of the past three decades resulted in an atrophy of capabilities and diminished readiness necessary to deter or defeat our great adversaries, or great power adversaries. My own early years in the Air Force, my own personal experience during the Cold War, preparing for the ultimate contested fight against the Soviet Union, my first operational experience was Desert Storm, where the territory and airspace of Kuwait and Iraq were both contested, at least at the beginning of the conflict. In both cases, my fellow airmen and I were confident that we would prevail because we had a qualitative advantages such as stealth, precision of weapons, electronic warfare, but perhaps most importantly, we had superior planning, superior training, exercises that kept us ready in the highest level of readiness the world had ever seen. As we re-engineer, reorganize, re-equip, and retrain for great power competition, there will be a sense of going back to the future. What's different today is that geography is not the only contested domain. Conflicts may no longer be primarily about natural resources, lines of communication, or disputed borders. Today, space, cyber, the electromagnetic spectrum, and information itself are just as contested as air, land, and sea, and arguably more so. I would also argue that time is contested, both in the sense of precision timing and decision space on the battlefield, as well as long-term time horizons to subvert or whittle away an adversary's advantage. Because of the multi-domain nature of modern conflict, the U.S. Air Force and industry must think differently about the future force and how it will be employed. There will be a need for highly survivable weapon systems that support the core missions of the Air Force. There will also be the need for affordable weapon systems to create a balanced, high-low force structure mix. Otherwise, maintaining the peace will be unaffordable. We must also think of conflict in terms of information assurance, supply chain vulnerabilities, industrial espionage, dual-use technologies, social media, and other non-conventional attack surfaces. To circle back to the question posed at the beginning, how should industry adjust to the Air Force of the future? My short answer is, industry must lead innovation. Our most vexing challenges must be met head on with boldness to try new paradigms. 
This will require resources to incentivize risk tolerance on both industry and government, or from both industry and government, creative problem solving, and partnerships based on trust and confidence. We can't and shouldn't divest legacy platforms overnight, but we also can't continue investing in the old, the new old. Our national security and the security of future generations demands the new new. Prototyping and experimentation are how the force will grow and evolve. I want to close with some thoughts on where I believe the Air Force will benefit and where industry must adjust to a new paradigm of prototyping and experimentation. These are fundamental, foundational fundamental capabilities that will re require rapid innovation, more rapid than our current acquisition system permits. Some examples are assured precision navigation and timing. Admiral Richardson mentioned uh, the importance of PNT. Well, we need to figure out how to operate without satellites in highly contested electromagnetic environments. Assured communications. Think of 5G for the combat cloud with resiliency and reliability that's robust and can survive threats. Global precision attack and the targeting capabilities that enable it. There are many modes and methods and we can't rely on only a few. We have to consider hypersonics, swarming unmanned aircraft, intelligent weapons, and directed energy. Persistent battle space awareness and shared uh, battle space awareness. We've been spoiled by years of ac unfettered access and now we need to deliver the same capabilities in contested spaces. When we talk about shared battle space awareness, it's not just a common operating picture, it's shared knowledge. Artificial intelligence, many comments on that today, but this is the ability to recognize patterns and discover knowledge undiscerned by the human operator. When we get there, it will be a game changer. The commercial sector is leading the way, and we need to somehow leverage this. Electronic warfare is another important area. Software-defined radios and other technologies are changing the nature of electronic warfare. Whoever dominates the EM spectrum will dominate the battle. Finally, cybersecurity and offensive cyber. We need to think of in terms of cyber from the front lines all the way to the last link of the supply chain. Thank you for my attention, or thank you for your attention. <laughs> um, short time is up. I'll happy to take any questions during the break.